Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Julia share the secrets to the best pan-seared pork chops. Jack challenges Julia to a tasting of white wine vinegar. And Keith makes Bridget the ultimate corn fritters. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Boneless pork chops are very appealing. I mean, they're relatively inexpensive, and since they have no bone, they're quick to cook and easy to eat. Yet they rarely taste good. I mean, look at these guys. They're cupped, so they only browned around the outside. No matter how much applesauce you dump on them, they're not gonna taste very good. But today, Bridget and I are gonna put an end to the tasteless pork chop once and for all. I've seen those before. Yeah, we've all made these at least once. Yes, so we're gonna make our own chops instead of buying chops from the supermarket because we want super thick chops. Really difficult to find chops that are even size and the thickness that we want. So we're gonna start with a pork roast and cut them ourselves. Now, these are both pork loin roast. This one's from the blade end, which is closer to the shoulder, and this one is the center loin cut. Now this is much more even in shape, so we're gonna use this. This is more uneven. It's got a few different muscles in here, so it's harder to get evenly sized chops out of it. You wanna buy about a two and a half to three pound center cut pork loin. That's gonna give us the nice thick chops that we want. We're only gonna make four chops out of this, so you know they're gonna be nice and thick. Take a sharp knife, cut right through in half, and each half and half again. Those chops are a lot bigger than anything you can find at the store. <laughs> yes, the technical term is honkin. They're big honkin chops. There we go. So since these pork chops are so thick, we're not gonna brine them. They're gonna stay nice and juicy without brining. All right, let's move on to our cooktop mm, here. My favorite pan. You love this. This is actually from your kitchen. I stole <laughs> it. They look kind of familiar. <laughs> Everybody should buy a cast iron skillet. It's perfect for this job. Now it's going to give the pork chops a beautiful brown crust. And we're not going to heat it on the stove top. It could be patchy in terms of how it heats. A few hot spots there, a cold spot over there. So we're gonna put it in a cold oven, turn the oven to 500 degrees. And by the time the oven is heated, the pan will be good and hot. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and season the chops. I'm gonna pat them dry. Let's go ahead and salt and pepper them. Nice amount of seasoning. A little salt and pepper on the second side. And by little, I mean a lot. I think pork can really take a good seasoning. So they're seasoned, let's go get the pan. Using two cloths in order to get this out. And we're gonna place this right on a burner here. Incredibly hot. Oh, you can feel the heat. Now, if I wasn't going to cook with this right on the heat, I might leave this towel right here to remind me not to reach for it, because you only do that once or yep. twice or 10 times before it really ingrains in your brain. So instead, I'm gonna use this little silicone grip uh -huh. thing. That's going to remind me not to touch the pan itself. Very handy. So I'll go ahead and put this on high heat. And if you wouldn't mind, there's two tablespoons of vegetable oil, nice neutral flavored oil. I'm gonna put that in there. We want it to get to the point where it starts to smoke. That's going to happen pretty quickly. And we're using plenty of oil here too, because unlike a steak where you might cut down on a little bit, of the oil because the steak itself is fattier. Pork is so lean, it really needs that oil to get a good brown crust. Now let's go ahead and put these in the pan. Oh, good sizzle. That's a good sizzle. Now we're gonna cook this on this first side for about two minutes, and what we're looking for is a nice light golden color. All right, let's check on those chops. Two minutes, flip it over. Some nice color. Again, it's a light golden brown. This is not finished at this point. We're gonna cook this second side another two minutes and then we're gonna start flipping the chops every two minutes until the crust is really dark golden brown. That's gonna take about 10, maybe 12 minutes. So why do we bother to flip these chops every two minutes? Well, heat causes proteins and meat to shrink. This means that the side of the chop in contact with the pan will shrink faster than the other side, causing that buckling effect. So by flipping the meat every two minutes, we shrink the proteins on both sides at an equal rate, countering the buckling effect, so that we end up with a nice even chop. I think our flipping time is done. Look how beautiful they are. Those are gorgeous. <laughs> I do want to check for temperature. I'm looking for pretty low temp, actually 125 to 130. And we are right in that range, so I can turn off the heat. Now that's lower than you'd usually do for pork chops. <laughs> Yes, and that is by design. I'm not trying to kill you. Good. So since these were cooked at a pretty high temp, we can actually take these off at a lower temperature and the carryover cooking heat is going to finish cooking them through. So if you wouldn't mind taking that little piece of foil and tenting those, we're gonna let that sit for about 15 minutes. Plenty of time to make a quick sauce. 
And our sauce is inspired by, you know, pork chops and vinegar peppers. Mm -hmm. No applesauce. I was going to say, what, no applesauce? <laughs> now we're making super quick sauce. It's got that briny, pickly flavor. Mm. Perfect with pork. Starting with three quarter cup of roasted red peppers. And we've got two little jarred cherry peppers here. A little bit mm. more heat. Taking the stems off. Two garlic cloves. And you didn't mince them before you put them in. No mincing. That's what this is for. We're using the food processor to make our lives easy. And we've got two anchovy fillets. It's not going to give a fishy taste, just really good savory flavor. This is two teaspoons of dried rosemary. Mm. We don't really use this a lot in the kitchen. Mm. A little bit goes a long way and it's gonna give this perfect flavor. We crush this just a little bit, but the food processor is going to do the rest. We've got a half a teaspoon of salt and an eighth of a teaspoon of black pepper. And we're gonna pulse this until it's finely chopped. It's gonna take about 15, maybe 20 pulses. All right, that looks good. Nice and finely chopped. Now we're gonna turn this into more of a sauce. So I've got a quarter cup of water and two tablespoons of white wine vinegar. We're just going to process it to combine. Boom. <laughs> that was easy. That was easy. And I'll go ahead and scrape this into a little bowl. But really all of those ingredients were pantry ingredients, even the rosemary. That's right, yep, so easy. To finish, get a third cup of extra virgin olive oil. I'll go ahead and whisk this in. Gonna make it nice and rich. And two tablespoons of chopped fresh parsley right at the finish. Lots of green and lots of fresh flavor. Ooh, that's pretty to boot. Ooh, beautiful. The 15 minute wait is over. The chops are up to temp. Nice 140 degrees. So we can eat them. They're gorgeous. Aren't they beautiful? Mm-hmm. All right, let me give you one here. Nice. Ooh. A little bit of sauce. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, a little bit more for you. Oh my gosh, this is a real looker. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, it went from the ugliest pork chop at the beginning yes. that applesauce couldn't cover to something that's really photo worthy. All right, the real test. Ooh, beautiful, juicy mm. meat. Mmm. The pork is really juicy. Again, we didn't brine it. Nope. So all that is just from cooking it to the right temperature, which was a little below what we usually do because the carryover was so big. Yep. That is delicious. And this sauce is amazing. I could put this sauce on anything. So for unbeatable boneless pork chops, start by slicing a roast into evenly sized chops. Cook them in a ripping hot cast iron skillet and flip them every two minutes. Once they reach 125 degrees, let them rest for 15 minutes and serve with a quick roasted red pepper sauce. And there you have it. From the test kitchen to your kitchen, a terrific recipe for pan-seared thick-cut boneless pork chops with a roasted red pepper and vinegar sauce. That was a mouthful. Mmm, so is this. <laughs> it's a better mouthful. Mm. White wine vinegar may not be as complex as balsamic, as romantic as sherry, or as punchy as apple cider vinegar, but that's exactly why it's important as a pantry staple. And Jack's here to tell us which white wine vinegar tastes best. I think you just called white wine vinegar boring. <laughs> no, actually I'm just trying to hold off on tasting these because I'm standing in the fumes and I'm getting a little nervous. Uh, I'm gonna make you get to work. Uh, these are straight from the bottle. We didn't bring any salad greens, any pickles, the things that you use white wine vinegar for. Yeah, so start they're drinking. in shot glasses. Yeah, you don't need to finish the glasses, <laughs> uh, but I wanted you to see vinegar right from the bottle. Start going, really small sips. Dig in. Uh, dig in, there's some crackers and there's some water if you need it. Cheers. So these are all made from wine grapes. Now, some of the vinegars. Ah, that's fiery. <laughs> All right. Well, you've got three Ooh, more to go. I know. <laughs> but this one has a lovely burn now, all the way down. I want you to look for ones that not only have acidity, but that have some sugar. All right. Um, so we found that the brands that had some sugar, we measured the sugar levels in them to complement the acidity not only tasted better from shot glasses, but better with salad greens or better in pickles. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting through the acidity to look for flavor, but this is a little bit of a challenge. This is tough. You're really, really strong. Mm -hmm. The acidity levels are either five, six, or 7%. We actually like the ones that had more acidity, but then had more sugar to go with them. And so ones that were low acidity and low sugar seem kind of bland. And if they had all that acidity and no sugar, oh my heavens, those are really eye-opening. We found that the brands that actually specify the wine grapes, that's a good thing. 
So our winner is made with Trebbiano grapes, Italian grapes that are fruity and crisp. If it's just made with generic wine, what they call in the industry wine stock, mm. that means that's grapes they don't even want to tell you what they're <laughs> using. That's not a good sign. I'm doing it. I'm, with, I'm still with you. You're still with me? Okay. <laughs> yes. I, 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 you're, this, you're awake. Yeah, I'm here. I'm very awake. <laughs> I'm buzzing. <laughs> now, this one has a very different color than the others. Yeah, I'm not really sure what grapes yield no <laughs> color whatsoever. Good point. So this is one of the brands, I would tell you, that did not identify what grapes it is using because no grape I've seen that makes wine makes anything close to that color. Gosh, that's nail polish remover. Oh, that's terrifying. You know what, you're picking up on a chemical mm. that actually can be part of the vinegar making process that is something gone wrong, that is the same chemical that is in nail polish remover. Mm. That is not a good sign. Okay, <laughs> so that was nail polish remover. Yeah, and you're not, it's not your imagination. It isn't just because I'm making you drink white wine vinegar from shot glasses. <gasps> oh, this is a rough one, Jack. All right, so is there anything that you are reacting more positively to? Yes, this one was the easiest one on my palate. There was sweetness to it, it felt balanced, and I don't know if it was the mildest of all the ones I had, and it did, but it didn't burn as much. Okay, so. <laughs> so that one is my favorite, least favorite for sure. It had no flavor, okay. nail polish remover. These kind of in the middle. I could go either way on these. So this one was definitely my favorite, definitely my least favorite. Would you like to see what you picked? Yes. <laughs> well, you have very expensive taste. Oh, yeah. Uh, we then <laughs> compared premium white wine vinegars. In this case, this is a champagne vinegar from mm. California. And we loved this compared to our supermarket favorites. It's, it's about delicious. five times the price. <laughs> it is made Fingers. with champagne grapes, as mm -hmm. the name would imply, and has nice fruitiness. Yeah, it's delicious. Uh, why don't you go here? All right. So this was our favorite of the mass market supermarket mm -hmm. brands. This is actually, despite the name, Napa Valley is from Italy. Mm. Uh, go figure, because oh. they do have grapes in Napa Valley. Yeah. This is made with Trebbiano grapes. And it does have more sugar, which balances out some of the acidity. I'm not sure you were quite getting all that, given the way you were drinking these. Yes. <laughs> this one, which I also liked. Uh, this is from Italy. You know, there were no bad choices here. Mm -hmm. They're all vinegars, but this did not have much sugar and we thought was less complex than the top choice. All right, and last and definitely least. Uh, and this is Holland House. This was at ah. the bottom of the rankings as well. It just didn't have any personality other than acidity. Mm -hmm. So if you have champagne taste like me, look for O Champagne Vinegar. But for something less expensive, look for Napa Valley Naturals Organic White Wine Vinegar at just $4.19. Russell J. wants to know, what's the best way to chop an onion? Well, you want to chop onion into even-sized pieces so that they cook at an even rate. And here's how to do that. Start with a sharp knife, and then go ahead and peel an onion, but keep that root intact. We've cut off the top here, peeled it. Now place it flat side down and cut right through the root. This is going to be clear in just a minute. To make your first cut, you want to cut straight down. You want to stop your blade about an inch from this root end. So we'll go ahead and go right through. Now we're gonna make a horizontal cut, series of them actually. So I'm putting my hand right on top of the onion, nice and flat, and starting from the bottom up, I'm gonna to start to move my knife right through, again, stopping about an inch from that root in. Now I have to say, some people like to go horizontal first and then do the vertical cuts. That's totally fine as well. And if you get a few loose pieces at this point, not a big deal. So finally, we're gonna make our final cut by cutting right across. And I'm using my fingers in that claw position. If it looks uncomfortable and it feels uncomfortable, you're doing it right. You wanna go all the way to the very end, take it as slow as you need, and then once you get to that piece at the root, you can go ahead, put it face down, and then just start chopping this. So there you go, this is the best way to chop an onion, again, giving you even pieces for even cooking. All right, let's get something straight. You and I know a bad corn fritter when we see one. And this is a bad corn fritter. It's not crispy at all. I'm gonna open it up. You can see it's nothing more than a squishy pancake with a few corn kernels thrown in. I love a corn pancake. That is not a corn fritter. Now we're gonna do a lot better and Keith is gonna show us exactly the right way to make righteous corn fritters. So achieving the perfect corn fritter with a crisp exterior, moist interior, and big corn flavor 
was a lot more difficult than we expected. Now, the problem was the flour, the flour that binds everything mm -hmm. together. Too much flour and it's bready like a pancake. Right. Too little, it's all over the front of you when you try to eat it. It's a crap. So the solution to our problems was in front of us the whole time. The corn, let me show you. All right. So I have two ears of corn here. I'm just gonna strip the kernels off this. I like to do this into a large bowl and that will kind of corral those kernels as they come off the ears. We have about one and a half cups of kernels in this bowl. Like I said, the flour is a real problem, but the flour is what holds the corn together. Now we needed to find something that would take place of that flour. So we figured that we would use the starches that are naturally occurring in the corn to do that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this corn, we're gonna put it in our food processor and make a nice puree that will hold everything together. Okay. We're gonna just buzz this for about 15 to 20 seconds until that corn is broken down into a coarse puree. Okay, I think that's good. You can see that it's nice and coarse. But in processing this corn, we're releasing a lot of great corn flavor, which was good for the fritters, but we're also releasing a lot of water, which was bad for the fritters. Right. So I'm just gonna transfer this over to a 12 inch nonstick skillet. You can start to see how milky that is. We wanna get rid of that milk. Driving off the excess moisture is gonna concentrate the flavor too. That's and you're right, if you hadn't done this, you would have had to add a lot more flour to it, and then you end up with that terrible pancake. So we're just gonna cook this over medium heat for about five minutes. Okay, it's five minutes and our corn puree is really thick. Very thick. Yeah, it's clinging to our spatula. And we've got a little browning on the bottom mm -hmm. here. That's okay. We really like that kind of sweet, roasty flavor that the puree took when it got a little dark. So I'm just gonna transfer this over to our large bowl, scraping out as much as that stuff I can get off the bottom of that. I mean, that's a quarter of the volume probably that you started off with. Now I'm gonna rinse this skillet out and we're gonna move on to the next step. Okay. So we like that roasty flavor that we got from cooking that puree. So we're gonna do the same thing with the remainder of the corn that's in our fritters. I have one and a half cups of kernels here, one teaspoon of oil, and it's over medium high heat. We're just gonna add our corn kernels and an eighth of a teaspoon of salt. We're just gonna let this cook for three to four minutes. Okay. You can see that we've got some light golden brown color on our kernels and you can smell that really roasty aroma. It smells Beautiful. so good. So I'm just gonna transfer this over with our puree and now we're just gonna make our batter and we can get to cooking. That sounds good. So we've built some great corn flavor here with that puree and the lightly brown kernels, but now we wanna balance that sweetness out a little bit. So I have two tablespoons of grated Parmesan cheese here. That's gonna add a little saltiness, a little bit of umami flavor. I have three tablespoons of minced chives. That's gonna give our fritters a little bit of freshness, a little bit of that onion flavor. Very nice. A pinch of cayenne pepper for heat. A quarter teaspoon of salt. So bring all those flavors together. And an eighth teaspoon of pepper. It's gonna stir this up, incorporate those things in there. The corn kernels that Keith added, it was a one and a half cups that you toasted alone. That's right. how much corn kernels, even less than a lot of people put in their total corn fritter, but used exactly the same amount as a puree. So you're right. getting double corn We've doubled flavor. down. Love it. So I have one lightly beaten egg here. That with the corn puree is gonna to start to bind everything together, hold everything together. Stir that in. And flour, we needed some flour to hold everything together, but I have a small amount, just a quarter cup. But a quarter cup of flour wasn't giving us that crispy exterior we wanted. So we searched around, we tried some breadcrumbs, we tried other things to give it a crisp exterior, but we settled on a tablespoon of cornstarch to give us the crispest exterior we could find. So let's talk about why we are adding cornstarch to our fritters. Cornstarch is made of microscopic pure starch granules. They hydrate and swell in the batter and then swell up and burst when the batter hits the hot oil and that releases amylose starch molecules. These molecules link up and form a lacy network. Now, as moisture evaporates during frying, the amylose network becomes brittle and crispy and that translates to perfectly crispy fritters. We're about ready to cook. I have a half cup of vegetable oil heating up over medium heat. We want that to shimmer. Okay. We have our batter done, ready to go. But before we get into cooking, I'm gonna make a maple chipotle sauce for our fritters. I have a half a cup of mayonnaise here. I have a tablespoon of chipotle peppers that have been minced up. Getting a little smoky flavor in there. Yeah, and a little bit of spice too, nice. which is nice. One tablespoon of maple syrup, and I have a half a teaspoon of Dijon mustard here. It's gonna give a little bit of acidity. 
This is a big step up from the honey butter that we used to make to serve with corn fritters. I love the idea of a little bit of spice in there too. This is mixed together and I think we can cook our fritters now. Our oil is at a shimmer. I'm gonna start with uh, this portion scoop. It's a really easy way to get two tablespoons of batter in there without having to measure out each tablespoon. We're gonna put six of these in at a time. A little bit of sizzle around mm -hmm. here. Not too much because you didn't want them to start burning immediately. No, there's a lot of sugar in here so they are gonna brown quite right. quickly. No, we don't want to leave our fritters in little balls like this, so I'm just <laughs> going to come by with a fish spatula and press these down into a two and a half to three inch diameter. I found a little secret is to dip this spatula in the oil before you try to push it down because that batter is a little sticky. Okay. That way we're going to have a nice crispy exterior, a little bit of creaminess on the inside. Lovely. We're going to let these cook two to three minutes until it's golden brown on that first side. Okay, I peeked underneath there and I can see that they're golden brown, so I'm just going to flip these over and cook the second side. Oh, beautiful. beautiful. So we're just going to let that go two to three more minutes on this side. Okay. These are beautifully golden brown on the second side. I'm just going to take these out and put them over to a paper towel lined tray just to wick some of that excess fat off the okay. outside. Okay. I'm going to start our second batch. And same thing as the first batch. We're just going to put these in, flatten them, cook them two to three minutes aside. Sounds great. Are you excited to eat these? So excited. Okay. I know what's gone into them, so I can't wait. One final embellishment is I have another tablespoon of minced chives here. I'm just going to sprinkle this over the top. Oh, beautiful. And I'm assuming you want sauce too, right? Uh, of course I want sauce. Let's try these. They are beautiful. Now, even before I tuck in, super crispy. Oh. Mm. A world away from that floury pancake at the very beginning that just had a few pieces of corn. These actually taste like fried corn. It's a really a nice balance of sweet and savory here. The corn flavor is super deep. It's really nice and toasted. As you said, almost roasted. I mean, I've eaten a lot of corn fritters in my day. These are by far the best corn fritters I've ever had. Great, I'm glad you liked them. So if you wanna make the ultimate corn fritters at home, prep corn kernels two ways. Puree and cook half, then toast the other half. Add herbs, parmesan, and for thickener, use both a little bit of flour and some cornstarch. Fry the fritters and serve with a delicious maple chipotle mayonnaise. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, the best corn fritters you will ever have. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Mm-hmm. Summer in a skillet. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later. <laughs>